I'd like to extend a special thank you and welcome to Van and his staff. Um, this is going to be one of Van's last appearances in the area for a little while. Um, as you all might know, uh, recently heard that Van is going to be joining the Obama administration. <laughs> as advisor for green jobs, enterprise and innovation. And we were hoping he would be able to sign books tonight, but he's not going to be able to because he needs to go home and finish packing because he's leaving tomorrow. <laughs> Before I introduce Van, I would like to acknowledge three people, um, a current student rep, a former student rep, Casey, who unfortunately can't be here tonight because he's at his sister's wedding, and Oliver. Uh, they were really instrumental in opening the doors so the conversations could begin between Green for All and Presidio to make this happen. Uh, the other per yeah. And the other person I would like to thank is Jamie, our events coordinator. Uh, a lot of behind the scenes planning has to take place for events like this, and since you've come on board, the caliber and level of our events just keep getting better. So thank you. So our guest speaker tonight is the founding president of Green for All, an organization that promotes green collar jobs and opportunities for the disadvantaged. Its mission is to build an inclusive green economy strong enough to resolve the ecolo ecological crisis and lift millions of people out of poverty. Van is a 1993 Yale Law graduate, a husband, father of two young boys. He's a tireless advocate committed to creating green pathways out of poverty and greatly expanding the coalition fighting global warming. Van is a Time Magazine 2008 environmental hero, one of Fast Company's 12 most creative minds of 2008, New York Times best-selling author of The Green Collar Economy, and his book is for sale in the back of the room. So enough about me talking about Van. Let's hear from the man himself. We want to thank you, welcome you, and congratulate you. I give you Van Jones. Hey. My mama is happy. <laughs> My mama's bragging. Tomorrow is Sunday school. So uh, well, I'm happy to see everybody. I am literally getting on an airplane tomorrow night at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, getting off uh, that plane and getting in the cab and driving with my suitcases to the White House. I report to duty at 9 a.m. tomorrow. So uh, this is my last speech uh, uh, that has not been vetted by anybody. So. <laughs> uh, uh, I hope I don't get in trouble. So, <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm a little rocky on my feet. We, we got confirmed uh, Friday. It was announced Monday, and I start work Monday. So it's just been a little bit of a whirlwind. And I'm literally uh, packing uh, all day, uh, all night, tomorrow, and leaving. So uh, I won't get a chance to stay and do like I usually do. You know, I'm usually here till the last dog barks, still, still talking to folks, but um, won't happen on this uh, time. Don't let that depress the book sales, though. I <laughs> took a big pay cut and got cheering. So um, uh, that's it. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, there's good news and there's bad news, and uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about both, and I'm going to try and keep it short so we can take a lot of questions, because you guys actually know a lot about this stuff. Frankly, you know a lot more about some parts of it than I do, so it'd be good to, for us to have more of a conversation, but, um, you know, the good news is that as bad as things look for the economy, and as bad as things look uh, for the environment, uh, and they look bad, um, there is a solution. Uh, 
we can beat global warming and the global recession at the same time. We can beat pollution and poverty. We can solve these big crises and actually be a stronger country and a healthier world on the back end of it. That's the good news. The good news is there is a solution. Here's the bad news. You're it. <laughs> You're it. Sucks to be you. <laughs> so, on behalf of a grateful nation, <laughs> I want to appreciate you for signing up to get us out of this mess. Give yourselves a round of applause. Uh, the reality is that uh, sometimes something really bad has to happen in order for something really good to happen. Uh, now, that's not to say that what's happening now is good. Uh, what's happening now is horrible. Uh, we have people who have worked every day, gone to work every day, uh, six days a week, seven days a week, sometimes two jobs, who are losing their homes. Uh, who are losing their pensions, their 401ks, uh, being thrown out of work all across the country. And the newspaper headlines only begin to scratch the surface of the human impact of that. Uh, so I'm not saying that this is a good thing. But what I'm saying is that uh, it is inevitable, it is a part of the human spirit to try to pull something good out of something bad. Uh, out of a breakdown, you can't have a breakthrough. And some people say that you, you know, if you look at your own personal life, sometimes you have to have a breakdown to have a breakthrough. Uh, if you look back at your personal life, it wasn't after you had seven great weeks in a row, you know, with everything going swell, <laughs> that you suddenly decided, you know, I'm going to start dieting and I'm going to move across the country, right? <laughs> you know, those great decisions usually come after a really bad day. You know, you lose a job, or uh, you get a bad medical diagnosis, um, or you come home an hour and a half too early. I'm, I'm sorry, that's... <laughs> I'm still getting over it, I'm still getting over it. <laughs> and suddenly you think to yourself, change is afoot, you know? <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta do something else. And then you know, it was horrible when it happens, you know, these things, these things happen. But when you look back, it was often, that was the time, huh? That you sit down and you reevaluate and you, you reassess and, you, and you, 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 you move in a different direction. That's what happens in individual lives and that's what is happening, I believe, in this country. It's a horrible breakdown, but it can lead to a breakthrough and it needs to. Because as awful as what we're experiencing right now is, uh, some people here on the front row and, and in this room have been warning uh, this country for a long time that what we have been doing is not sustainable. Now, we say that so often that sometimes we just kind of we just zip past the words. But you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, if something's not sustainable, that means it's going to stop, right? <laughs> it won't keep happening. At some point, it will be over. Welcome to 2009, right? I mean, that's where we are. Uh, we spent uh, not just eight years, everybody likes to kick that, what's that guy? <laughs> I, I took his letter out of the alphabet. I don't use any words with W in them, you may notice. <laughs> Lots of good replacement words for you know, victory instead of win. I, you don't, I don't even use that letter anymore. Um, I've forgotten about him. Uh, but we still have all these problems. And um, my fear is that going into the White House and trying to clean that place up is going to be like trying to clean out a barn with a sipping straw in terms of <laughs> the amount of crap that we got to get out of there. Um, I probably can't say that Monday, so. <laughs> I'll say it here. Um, uh, I'm just saying it's bad. I mean, it's. I gotta work on that. Um, uh, 
but it wasn't just the past eight years, right? It wasn't just one political party, it wasn't just one president. If we want to be honest about it, if we want to fix the problem, it was both political parties and a number of presidents going back at least 30 years, if not 40, uh, that sold the American people a bill of goods, uh, uh, an economic philosophy, an economic strategy that had at least three major fallacies built into it, baked into it. Uh, the first fallacy was that we could be the number one economy in the world by being the number one consumer, not the number one producer. Right? So we just send all the jobs overseas. We don't need any blue collar jobs here. We don't have to produce anything here. We'll just send those jobs overseas. God bless those countries that got those jobs. And we'll just base our economy based on online shopping, you know, uh, <laughs> going to the mall and lattes. You know, like somehow this was some brilliant economics, but both parties said, hey, this is great, you know, um, NAFTA and all this stuff. And, uh, and if you, if you said, geez, this might work out badly, you know, you were called a protectionist and a Luddite and all kinds of stuff. So you're like, well, never mind, you know, excuse us. You know, we tried to point this out in Seattle and, you know, uh, 10 years ago, uh, Ali Starr is here. Give her a round of applause, one of the big leaders of the anti-globalization struggle. If, if the country had listened to people like Ali Starr and other folks who, who marched in Seattle 10 years ago, maybe we, we wouldn't have been here. But, uh, you know, both political parties said we were, you know, silly and naive and tear gassed us and, you know, we just went, went home and, you know, tried to, you know, get jobs and it got harder and harder. One of the things that has since happened is that now it turns out it was bad for both our country and for Asia, for Asia to have built up this huge export-led uh, strategy to develop itself. Uh, you know, it's not about some kind of jingoism or anti-Asia thing. It, it, it turned out it was a bad strategy for them, too, because now their economies are in, in going into tailspins. Uh, so the idea that we could have the number one economy in the world forever uh, consuming more than we produce turned out to be a fallacy. Number two, the idea that we could run our economy forever based on credit and debt rather than smart savings and thrift like our grandparents. Uh, you know, that, you know, just build the economy up on credit cards. Uh, you know, this kind of this, this problem in the world economy where, uh, to keep it simple, uh, Americans, God bless us, you know, we spend too much and we save too little. And our sisters and brothers in China, God bless them, they save too much and they spend too little. So there's this big imbalance in the world economy. Uh, our sisters and brothers in China, God bless them, always have a big pile of cash looking for someone to lend it to. And we always have a big pile of credit cards, you know, <laughs> looking for someone to borrow from. And uh, we had people who were hawking their homes to buy flat screen TVs to cover the holes in their lives. Right? And you can't do that forever. But we acted as if we could just keep on with these mega bubbles and they would never pop. That was a fallacy. And then the third fallacy was the idea that we could run our economy forever based on ecological destruction and environmental heedlessness rather than ecological restoration. Right? We could just keep turning beautiful living systems into dead products that are shoved out the back of the door into landfills and incinerators and do that over and over and over again. Turn beautiful living things into dead stuff and then into trash. And the faster you do that, the more growth you have. Right? That's the definition of growth that we were operating under. And you never count what counts. You know, carbon, free. You know, just, it's free to me and you, drive your car, dump carbon out the back, run your factory, dump carbon, free to you, except it's gonna cost us the entire planet. Right? You guys study that stuff, it's called a market failure, right? <laughs> uh, biggest market failure in the history of economics. Right? Never count what counts, and it's never going to catch up to us, it will, it'll all just be fine. Don't worry about it. Except that now, weather's kind of wacky. You may have noticed this. Uh, you know, we used to have these things called seasons, where it would be cold for several days in a row and never be 60 degrees in the middle. Remember that, seasons? Uh, don't really have seasons so much anymore. Every morning, you got to you know, look out, should I wear a jacket, should I not? That's strange. 
Um, and, and the scariest channel on television now, the Weather Channel. <laughs> you can't even let your children watch the Weather Channel. <laughs> You're like, no, no, go watch Freddy Krueger. I don't want you to have any <laughs> nightmares watching that Weather Channel. Uh, so, you know, uh, and that has a cost too. And so here we are, three fallacies, both parties guilty, that we could have consumption over production, credit and debt over thrift, and ecological destruction over ecological restoration. That defines the economy that just collapsed. That is the gray economy. That is a gr the gray economy, the, consum the, the consumer-based, consumption-based, credit-driven, uh, fake economy that is now crashed. But it's opposite. It's opposite. Back to local production. Back to thrift. Back to ecological restoration. That is the green economy. And even as this economy is crashing, you see the green economy beginning to push its way through. And it's mainly coming through your hearts, your vision, your willingness to say, even though I have counterparts in business school right now, who would have a hard time meeting a single bottom line, I'm committed to figuring out a way to meet a triple bottom line. Because I think that there's something that's happening in the workings of history, in the workings of the economy, in the logic of survival that will require that. And I want to get there first. That's who you are. You're saying, I want to get there first. You're saying, I'm willing to take a chance with my career, because what's my career anyway if we have a dead planet? What's my career anyway if we're going to be fighting wars over water? Right? And so uh, you are the answer, the solution. The government cannot solve this problem. The government can stop uh, supporting the problem makers and give you a level playing field and support so you can become the problem solvers. I mean, the role, for, the role for me is to make sure that the government is no longer an ally to the problem makers. Uh, big oil and big coal and all these uh, 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 troublesome legacy energy technologies and can be a partner to you. But at the end of the day, there will be no green jobs. There'll be no green employees without green employers. At the end of the day, all the tax credits in the world, all the support in the world won't make a difference if there's not an entrepreneur who's willing to step up and put a product or a service in the field. And that's who you are. And so what I want to say to you is that you have a tremendous burden, and I'm about to add to it. <laughs> you say, Jesus, man. I thought this guy was inspirational. <laughs> the, I could have stayed home and watched cable TV. You have a tremendous burden, and I want to add to it. I want to ask you to go beyond the beyond you've already gone. Because there is still a danger that we could beat some of these negative indicators. We could find some new clean energy strategy. We could find some new water conservation strategy. We could find some way to use smarter materials, but still have eco-apartheid, but still be living in a country where the benefits of your genius, the benefits of your work, the benefits of your enterprises only reach the haves and the have-nots are still struggling in the pollution-based economy, coughing in the fumes of the remnants of the pollution-based economy, uh, their children suffering with asthma and cancer, Can you suffering with asthma and cancer in the pollution-based economy. That's a danger. That's a danger. And there's only so much that the government can do about that. There's only so much that laws and regulations and policies and decrees can do about that. Because at the end of the day, if we wind up with a green economy where the entrepreneurs don't want to hire 
a diverse workforce. We'll be in court 20 years trying to make you do it. If, if you don't want to pay women fairly, if we, if we reproduce the same sick sexism we have in our workforce right now, where women make 70 cents on the dollar, and that's, a, that's considered a, a, a good company, uh, we'll be in 20, 20 years in court trying to make you do it. Uh, maybe we'll win that case, maybe we'll lose it, but let me tell you this. We don't have any excuse in our generation for that kind of outcome. We're the first generation of Americans. I was born in 1968. I was born the year Dr. King was killed. I was born the year Bobby Kennedy was killed. We're the first generation of Americans that gets a chance to create whole new sectors, whole new industries, whole new products, whole new services, a whole new economy, post, post 200 years of struggle around equality and equity and equal opportunity, which means we have the opportunity to do something truly extraordinary. We get to build a green economy that Dr. King would be proud of, right? We get to build a green economy that Dr. King would be proud of. We get to say, we're gonna build a green wave together, but it's a green wave that's gonna lift all boats. Uh, we don't believe that we have any throwaway species or resources, or people either, or children either, or neighborhoods either. And if you make a commitment that some part of your business model will address the need to make sure that those communities that were locked out of the benefits of the pollution-based economy are locked in somehow to the work and the wealth and the health of the green economy, if you will make a commitment that some part of your business model will make sure that those communities that were pressed down by the pollution-based economy are lifted up in this new clean and green economy. You will have achieved something that no generation of entrepreneurs has achieved in this country yet. To make real those things that we have our children say in kindergarten about liberty and justice for all. America the beautiful with no exceptions. You have that ability. Now, if you are willing to meet that challenge, I believe that the government owes you something. I think we need to make sure you have access to a world-class workforce. I think that we need to make sure that people are trained and ready. Uh, that's why I fought so hard for the Green Jobs Act of 2007. That's why I'm so proud that uh, President Obama in the recovery package put half a billion dollars uh, into job training, green shop job training. Uh, we need to make sure that if you're willing to meet people halfway, that there's tax credits for you and help for you. But none of that will make a difference if you don't have it in your heart to be successful with that employee when she walks in the door. Because if, you're, if, you, if you don't have it in your heart, you'll get the tax credit and you'll push them right out in the third quarter. We've seen that. Uh, it's uh, dangerous for us not to do it. If we create a green economy that excludes people, that leaves people out, bottom line, we'll have a backlash alliance between the polluters and poor people. I just want you to understand that. As business leaders, you get a chance to testify in front of Congress, you get a chance to stand in front of your city councils, you get a chance to grab uh, the attention of every decision maker in America. If you're a business leader, you have that ability. And what you don't want to happen is what's been happening in green politics right now, having the polluters stand up and say, these people point to you when you go and want support for the solar industry or want support for wind or want support for any of the green industries. What happens is you guys stand up right now, the people who are already out of school, and they ask for that, and then polluters stand up and people paid by polluters stand up. You know what they say? They say, these people just want to put green taxes on poor people. These people just want to raise costs for everybody else to pay for their little hybrid revolution. But most people in America are never going to drive a hybrid, and they're never going to have solar panels. And these people are essentially eco-elitists who want their niche industries funded by everybody else, but everybody else can't be a part of those niche industries. And it happened to us last summer with a climate bill. We have polluters standing up there crying crocodile tears on behalf of poor people. 
I mean, big polluters too. And I was like, I, I didn't know you cared, you know? <laughs> Where have you been all my life, you know? Next bill, go to hell. I'm like, well, I thought you loved us so, you know? It was, it, was, it was shameful. It was shameful. So I think we should dream a little. We're going through a nightmare right now. Let's dream big. Let's dream big. Let's dream big, you know? Uh, let's say to some of these kids standing on street corners that we want to give them a shot, give them an opportunity. People coming home from wars, people coming home from prison. Uh, I'm always shocked at these environmental folks, my sisters and brothers in the environmental movement, who get passionate about recycling. I mean, passionate, man. I mean, you got to take a few steps back. It's like, I get it, I get it. I'm putting my can in the blue one. I mean, the green one. I mean, the whichever one. I'm on your side, you know. And I think it's great, and I'm for it, you know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I try to recycle two or three times. I pick it up and put it back in there, you know. <laughs> I feel virtuous. But if we're going to do all this to give materials a second chance, if we're going to do all this to give dead stuff a second chance, what about giving people a second chance? What about giving human beings a second chance? What about, uh, if we're gonna have a green economy based on reclaiming thrown away stuff, can we reclaim some throw, thrown away neighborhoods too? I mean, to me, that's the, the big opportunity that we have. And we're gonna have to retrofit and repower and rebuild the country anyway. We're gonna have to do it anyway. And it turns out that you cannot beat global warming without greening the cities. 75% of our greenhouse gas problem is cities. Right? Buildings leaking too much energy, fixing that, jobs, contracts, careers, opportun uh, entrepreneurial opportunities for, for people, just to retrofit millions and millions of buildings. Got to deal with the traffic patterns. Right? So transit, new vehicles, and all that kind of stuff, jobs, contracts, opportunity. We gotta deal with our food systems. We gotta figure out some way to get the food closer to the plate. So you can imagine rooftop gardens and uh, uh, multi-story greenhouses and vertical gardens and community gardens and uh, urban agriculture, jobs, contracts, opportunity. We gotta do something about the water now. We can't just be treating the precious water that we have as waste. We gotta find ways to capture it, cisterns and reuse it, right? permeable surfaces. Jobs, contracts, opportunities. You cannot beat global warming without dealing with the food system in cities. Urban food system, urban uh, built environment, urban transit, urban water. Well, that means you can't beat global warming without greening the cities. Well then, if we're gonna have to green the cities, let's green the ghettos first, you see? Let's green the barrio first. Let's go there first. And you are going to be in a position to go talk to any mayor, any congressperson, uh, any workforce investment board, any school board, and say, I've got a proposal. Now the government is active again on the side of good stuff to help you spend your money better. Because if the government gives its money to you or gives you a tax break, you get to make the argument that you're not some crazy liberal berserkly person. Okay, you are. But, <laughs> Don't lead with that, is all I'm saying. Don't, don't, don't lead with it. No. You get to say right, that you're the most fiscally conservative, fiscally responsible business leaders in the history of humanity. Why? Because if you get a dollar to say retrofit buildings and use clean, non-toxic materials and do it the right way, that same dollar that's being used and then cut energy bills for that homeowner, that business owner, cuts, those, cuts that bill, is also cutting unemployment because you're putting people to work. If you put the right people to work, you're cutting poverty rates. Right? 
gets better than that. If you're, if you're in a place where coal-fired power plants are powering all these buildings that are leaking all this energy, then your retrofit, if it pulls down the energy use by 30%, you're pulling down greenhouse gas emissions by 30%. So that same dollar just cut greenhouse gas emissions. Well, if the power plant has to work less hard, doesn't cut on those peaker plants all the time, you just cut air pollution. It's that same dollar. That same dollar also just cut asthma, right? Just improve public health. And you improve the value of that building. Your green dollar is working harder. Your green dollar works overtime, double time, triple time, right? You can stand up in front of anybody, Republican, Democrat, red state, blue state, and say, if we're going to stop wasting money and wasting resources, invest in my company. And the more that your company is about meeting multiple objectives and doing them well, uh, the bigger your audience should be. Uh, now, the reason I say that to you is because your job is so big. This is not, I talk a lot about clean energy stuff, that's my thing, but this is not just about a clean energy revolution as I move to my close. This is deeper than a solar panel, what I'm talking about and what you're talking about. If all we do is a clean energy revolution, we're dead anyway. I want to be clear about that. We have to do the clean energy revolution because if we don't, we'll cook the planet, right? We'll turn the earth into an oven. So we have to do that. But that's just the first step. If all we do is, is clean energy, and we don't deal with the way that we're dealing with water and food and waste and toxins and each other, you know what we have? That's what we have. Solar-powered bulldozers. Right? <laughs> Solar-powered bulldozers to create more sprawl. Solar-powered buzz saws to chop down more rainforest. Uh, Biofueled bombers. <laughs> That'll be our great achievement. Biofuel bombers, and we'll be fighting wars for the lithium for the batteries as opposed to oil for the engines. And we'll be on a dead planet. It'll just be a moderate temperature. <laughs> That'll be our great achievement. You know. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. And you can do better than that. So. But we can't do that in the old silos of labor over here and business over here and white folks over here and the people of color over there. And the Job's too big for that now. Now it's too late. We need each other. We need each other. And what the Obama phenomenon represented was that beauty, hmm? that, 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 that cross-class, cross-race, solution-oriented hopefulness that was able to win on one day, called Election Day. What you represent is the opportunity to extend that, extend it from the shallow domains of politics into the deep waters of the economy, and win every day, win every day, meeting a triple bottom line and bringing people together in the workplace to do great things. That is a balm that we need. That's a bomb that we need. And if you do that work right and well, if you do that work right and well, someday, I'm sorry to tell you, and I'm sorry to tell this to your founder, but someday there will be no green MBA programs. <laughs> That's going to be the success. There should be no green MBA programs anywhere in the world. There should just be MBA programs that don't teach people to do things that are dumb and mean. <laughs> that's, that's what we should have. That's what we should have. There should be no green buildings. There should just be buildings. Big, you know, beautiful buildings. And then some old relics from the past that for some reason wasted a lot of energy and a lot of water and had toxic materials in them. And children won't even believe it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And there was probably slavery too, right. right. Why would somebody build a building out of toxic materials, mom? Right. Right. 
That's where we're going. That's where we're going. Because of you. Because of you. Someday, I mean, my job title is Special Advisor for Green Jobs and Enterprise and Innovation. My big hope, my big hope is that there aren't any green jobs. Not a single green job. You shouldn't be able to find a green job. All you should be able to find is people going to work every day, helping each other, respecting the earth, and making sure that people are here seven generations from now. That's the victory. That's where we're going. And thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you.